have Mr. Paul Palmarosa presenting, Mr. Robert Arnett, Mr. Chirapat Mr. Prapan Divya. You're going to see the least at last, but I'm not going to be falsely immodest either and say the best for the last. But when it comes to language and literature, let me tell you that what India has to offer is certainly next to no other country in the world. Uh, I'm going to very quickly run through, uh, how do I? Okay, lovely, good. Uh, in my show, I want to tell you that there's some good news and there's some bad news. The good news is that as a linguistic and literary area, I suppose the Indian subcontinent or India is one of the richest in the world. Just imagine what would the world be without the Vedas, the Upanishad, the Mahabharat, the Ramayana, the Shadadarshanas, Tripitaka, Jaina literature, Sangam literature, Shilapadikaram, Mani Mekhalai, the Divya Prabandhams, Andal, Manikavachagar, Kamban, Tulsi, Kabir, Basava, Tukaram, Pothana, and so on and on and on, right to Tagore, Shurabindo, Nepal. In fact, there's a wonderful book by Raymond Schwab called The Oriental Renaissance, which says that Europe's rediscovery of India's classical past is what triggered their second renaissance. The first was triggered by the discovery of their own Greek and Latin texts in the past. But the bad news is there are fundamental obstacles to our own self-understanding. There's a great deal of ignorance about ourselves and our traditions, of course, and we have to take cognizance of some remedial measures, recognition, rectification, and restoration. Uh, the sad truth is that none of our writers today, apart from those writing in English, has any global profile to speak of, though we have such rich literature in more than 22 languages. Part of it is a problem of translation and the fact that our own awards, including the Gyan Peet Award, which for the first time has gone to Amitav Ghosh, an English writer, do not have international recognition let alone the Sahitya Academy and the regional awards, which are not recognized at all. So the question for all of us and for those interested in soft power uh, is how to change this. Can we build our own ecosystem where our own language, languages and literatures are recognized the world over? Uh, so, oh. oh, oops, okay. So let me quickly run through this. Uh, what are the axes of misunderstanding that we face? One is, of course, the colonial past, the imperial gaze, Orientalism and after. You know, the empire of knowledge in which we are still subalterns. We are still on the fringes of the empire of knowledge. And, of course, epistemic neo-imperialism. We see, we heard here how India has such a bad press the world over, partly because of this. Um, we had a panel on education system. Unfortunately, a higher education in India is in a really bad state. Our best students are exported abroad. And what we have in India, look at our PhDs in the social studies and humanities, and you'll see that we've become a country where our young people are not taught to think clearly. Our own knowledge of our languages is so dismal, not, not just English, any language, our own mother tongues. And, Without knowing our own languages, how can there be cognition? And then the idea of the heathen in his blindness. This is a phrase I've got from S. Balagangadhara, who was supposed to be a S. N. Balagangadhara. And how the dominance of the Judeo-Christo-Islamist, secularist, Marxist, scientist prisms, you know, really dominates the world. I can, I can just call it, uh, you know, the age-old tension between the monothetic I don't call them monotheistic, the monothetic and, uh, you know, uh, the, the plurithematic. That's, that's what India is. And it's this pluralism which is, in fact, a threat. And finally, our own stupidity and incompetence, where we have come to substitute, uh, you know, slogans, shibboleths, political correctness, and all kinds of virtue signaling and gesturing for real knowledge of our own traditions, for real textual competence to understand uh, you know, our own traditions. And this is what we face today, that whatever we may say about foreign scholars, 
they are still producing critical editions of our own text, which we are unable to produce. For the last 30, 40 years, I, I doubt whether there's been any major Indian text which has been critically reinterpreted or even a critical edition and translation of our major text has been produced uh, in India. Anyhow, but how do we go from the remedial to the intermedial? I just wanted to say that when it comes to power, both soft and hard, uh, just read The Secret of the Veda by Sri Aurobindo. You see that a Vedic mantra was a combination of action. I mean, it was kriya, right? And it was also poetry. It was aesthetics. In addition to that, it was mantra. And finally, it was transformative, so that transformative. In other words, it could do real things in the real world, elevate your consciousness, and actually harmonize the three worlds, you know, the human world, the natural world, and the supernatural world, or the world of the gods. And somewhere we lost that, you know. We lost that integral knowledge, the integral epistemology of the Vedas. And uh, actually the challenge for tomorrow, if we have to preserve planetary existence itself, is how to regain it. But, but just look at, look at the resources that India has when it comes to language and literature. Uh, there is the Shatapata Brahmana, the Kalpa Shastra, where the force of imagination is what brings the world into existence. A great grammatical tradition uh, of, you know, and then Tantra and Trika, and finally to Sri Aurobindo. I have uh, uh, here uh, a slide which tries to encapsulate, you know, this entire uh, structure of how our poetic literature can be understood. You can just glance at it. We don't have you know, time to look at it, but it, it looks at the diversity of our literary traditions in the classical period, you know, from Kavya to Drama to Shravya, you know, the Sanskrit, Prakrit, Apabhramsha, the Mishra, and of course later the great so-called vernaculars and their efflorescence where, in a sense, we share the same chronology with Europe as well, when all our great languages of today, you know, burst forth uh, from the 8th, 9th, 10th centuries onwards. Uh, uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, just to go over this Wang Mai, the, the huge, uh, you know, corpus of material that is expressed in words. And, uh, you know, you can see in the Agni Purana, Dhvani, Varna, Pada, Vakya, Shastra, Itihas, Kavya. And, uh, you know, the classification systems also of these great texts uh, which were prevalent at that period. And let's not forget our great grammatical tradition, perhaps India's, one of India's greatest gifts to the world. Uh, I think about Panini's grammar, Leonard Bloomfield called it one of the greatest monuments of human intelligence. Uh, and we have the Trimurti, Panini, Katyayan, and Patanjali, you know, and uh, I don't think there's anything in contemporary times, in fact, in the whole history of human thought that can match what Panini accomplished. Uh, I want to quickly go over some more of uh, uh, our own ways in which we understood, uh, uh, you know, Sahitya. Uh, you know, look at Vishwanatha, Sahitya, Darpana, and the varieties of drama. You know, 10 varieties of drama were produced in India. Uh, we don't know most of them. We only know Natak, you know. But look at the other one, Prakrana and uh, uh, Vyayoga. We've, we've lost all of these uh, Vithi, you know, the smaller uh, Praharshana and all that. All these different varieties of drama we've lost. Here's another classification, Raja Shekhara's Kavya Mimamsa, a really famous text of 8th and 9th century. Uh, which, uh, which explains the fundamental features of Indian literature, which is it is multilingual, it's not just in Sanskrit. In fact, Kalidasa's plays have Sanskrit and Prakrit spoken. Uh, it's also regionally diverse, and it is in a variety of forms and styles. And it's also secular, it's not just divine or spiritual literature. We produced a huge quantum of secular literature, whether it was in metallurgy or medicine. And the quantum of that I'm going to come to that very soon, uh, towards the end of my slideshow. Uh, uh, I want to bring one aspect of our great literary 
and grammatical tradition which is not that well known. And that refers to the Trika tradition of Kashmir, what is often called Kashmir Shaivism. And I want to refer you to this incredible text which has been translated as the Trident of Wisdom, Paratrishika Vivarana. Jaydev Singh has translated it, and uh, Paul Muller Ort Ortega has written a foreword to it. And the basic idea in this text is that the whole world is composed through vak, through, through language, you know, through vak shakti. And if you, if, you, if you can master vak, you can actually, oh, well, sorry. Okay, I want to read you just one little piece from here. The Supreme contains all the letters of the Sanskrit alphabet, the 50 letters and the 16 vowels from la to ha are forms of energy representing the supreme that is transcendent to manifestation. The remaining 34 phonemes are consonants and they are also forms of energy manifesting the various tattvas or categories of existence. So phonemes are not merely inert letters. They are creative powers of the universe. The universe is not simply visible phenomenon or manifestation of the divine. It is the utterance of paravak, the verbal power of the divine. Manifestation is known as varna shrishti, phonemic creation in Shivagama. The phonemes are the matrikas. The little mothers who are busy creating the universe and in affecting everyday activities, act activity of life. So, in other words, every word, every syllable, if uttered with the power of awareness and knowledge is actually a mantra. So this tradition is so powerful when it comes to language and literature, and we've forgotten it. It's like standing on the heaps of a ruined civilization with uh, signs and symbols which, you know, you cannot decode. Like uh, Sadhguru said, you know, you've got a container, but the key is lost. You don't know what's in it. Here's a chart of the arrangement of the matrikas. Uh, if you just look very quickly in the, in the para samvitti, and uh, we don't have time to go into it, but it just gives you a sense of how deeply they understood the different shaktis represented by uh, vak power, the power of consonants and vowels. In fact, consonants and vowels produce the universe because they are female and male, and in their union, uh, not just sounds are produced, you know, like sphota, but the whole universe comes into being uh, through that. I want to very quickly go over to the, go over the period of Persian ascendancy in India. There are two periods of this. One is during the so-called Sultanate and then the Mughal period. And we hardly know that more Persian literature was produced in India than actually in Iran. And this is what we do in India. Even when we take something over, especially when it comes to language and literature, we simply outperform and outproduce uh, even the place where we borrowed it from. Um, in the colonial period, we, you know, we are very familiar with this, I don't want to go over, but we produced a Nobel laureate, Rabindranath Tagore, what an incredibly successful and uh, you might say astounding literary phenomenon. Novels, short stories, poems, songs, plays, uh, you know, literary criticism, essays, there's nothing in the entire gamut of literary production that he, he did not quite try, autobiography as well. Uh, and of course, Sri Aurobindo, I think one of the greatest minds of the, of the world of the 19th and 20th centuries. Now, I want to come to a slightly controversial topic because in the last few uh, you know, years, we are so fond of talking about uh, how English dominates India and how English should be dislodged. And, uh, um, I think it's more important to say Lao than Hatao because uh, one of the things we don't want to acknowledge, this is the 2001 census of India. 2011 is even more radical. English is the second most widely spoken language in India. So to reverse this is not going to be easy. The number of sp English speakers, if you just look, look there, is 125 million, which is more than those in UK second only to the United States. And of course, they are not first language speakers. The first language speakers of English are only 226,000. These are second and third language speakers 
of English in India. And in the 2011 census, the figure has gone from 12.818% to over 14%. Now, that is a huge number. It's, I would suppose, 150 million people. So we shouldn't forget that Indians have contributed to English literature on an unprecedented scale in the last few decades. You have several Booker Prize winners who are Indians or of Indian origin, V.S. Naipaul, Salman Rushdie, Arun Dhati Roy, Kiran Desai, Arvind Dadiga. You can look at the others who have been nominated. Midnight's Children by Salman Rushdie was nominated for the Booker of the Bookers. For 25 years, they believed no text was more influential than a book written by an Indian in English. V.S. Naipaul also won the Nobel Prize, of course, in 2001. So this is an incredible success. And finally, our own homegrown uh, successes. Amish, my friend, was supposed to be here. He's not here. He gets an advance of a million dollars, about five or six crores, for a set of books that he writes, which is more than what Rabindranath Tagore earned in his whole entire life uh, from literature. So times are changing, and India is going to become and has already become a superpower when it comes to the production of English texts. I now come to the end of my presentation. Uh, I, want to, I want to point out that if you look at the total number of manuscripts in any Western text, uh, the maximum is attributed to the New Testament. And I've, I've put down some figures there, 5,800 Greek, about over 10,000 Latin, and 9,300 other manuscripts in ancient languages. If you add up all of these, they come to about 26,000 manuscripts. But there are more than 4.1 million manuscripts in India cataloged by the Manuscript Mission of India as of 2016. There must be more. These have been cataloged. And of these, 1.6 million, 1.16 million, pardon me, are in Sanskrit alone. So this was the quantum of literary production in India. Uh, I want to come to the conclusion of my presentation. And we have an excellent panel. Uh, I just want to read this out. Verbal art with its history of continuous evolution and development for over three millennia in India had the declared purpose of attaining worldly success in the here and now and everlasting glory or immortality in the hereafter. Cleos ap aptiton of the Greeks, which is a younger cognate of the Sanskrit sh uh, Shreyo Akshatam. This aspiration was to be accomplished by the positive realignment and harmonization of three orders of existence, the human, the natural, and the divine.